She's flying a plane! That's right she is, because we're getting a double dose of girl power, at least on the Power Rangers side, in the eighth installment of the all-new Mighty Morphin Jew Rangers. Okay, so especially after last time, I've gotten a few comments asking what episode order I'm following to make this series. I mentioned back in episode 2 that I was carrying ahead with High Five rather than Food Fight, despite Food Fight being the second aired Mighty Morphin Power Rangers episode. Then last time I jumped ahead to switching places, which both in terms of air date and home video order comes way later in the season. It's probably not too much of a surprise to learn that its corresponding episode My Master was the next episode in the Zhu Ranger order, and up until now I've been following that. That was especially important early on given that Zhu Ranger has a bit more of an ongoing narrative, and doing those episodes out of order wouldn't make a lot of sense. However, at the same time, I am interested in seeing the progression of Power Rangers' ability to adapt this footage, so I shouldn't jump too far away from their production order. The problem is, I'm not sure what that is. I'm at a loss because I've had a hard time finding verifiable information on Power Rangers. The DVD episode order? I have no idea what that's even based on. It seems to be considered the de facto order of viewing the series nowadays, but why? It's not the order in which they were aired, and according to Wikipedia, it's not even the production order. So should I follow that? But there's no source as to where these so-called production codes come from. They appear to just be the Zhu Ranger order, which I find a little too convenient. It makes some degree of sense, but I have a hard time believing they stayed completely faithful to that, especially when you get to episodes like Power Ranger Punks, but that's a story for another day. Basically, whatever I choose is going to come with complications. If anybody more knowledgeable than me wants to chime in, please feel free. It looks like they're going to be choppy waters ahead once the Sixth Ranger shows up. Yay. Zhu Ranger has only one, to my knowledge, accepted episode order. It's one that makes complete narrative sense and follows the original air dates. So at least I have a reasonable amount of confidence in not screwing that up, and that's why I'm following it right now. That brings us to Foul Play in the Sky, which is the 10th episode we're covering, despite it being the 14th Power Rangers episode on the DVDs, and the 13th to air. However, Wikipedia gives it the production code of 110, directly after I, I, Guy, and that lines up with our next Zhu Ranger episode, Fire the Golden Arrow. For better or worse, that's what I'm covering today. It's kind of amazing to think about. Teamwork and Different Drum have both focused on the character of Kimberly. However, it's not until episode 13 of Zhu Ranger that May gets an episode about her, and quite frankly, I have to put a pretty big asterisk on this too. A new Dora monster, Dora Ladon, inspired by the creature from the labors of Heracles, is attacking children, causing plants to grow out of their heads and eventually turn them into giant apples. Turns out that May's direct ancestral line and their legendary archery skills have taken care of this mythical beast in the past by firing at the apple on Dora Ladon's head. Knowing that, a disguised Totepot takes May out at the very beginning with, ironically, a poison apple. If May can't fight off the poison and come out of her deep sleep, the other Zhu Rangers are doomed. As an aside, I sometimes have to step back and appreciate how wonderfully goofy this show is while remaining completely sincere in that goofiness. Imagine you're a performer being told you have to engage in weeping histrionics over a giant fiberglass apple. Or you have to deliver a line like, That bunny must have been Bondora's man, as if you're blowing the lid off of a criminal drug ring. Anyway, I put an asterisk on this being about May because, while the story is centered on her, she's removed from much of the action. It wouldn't be fair of me to say that she simply sleeps the whole time and has nothing to do because that's not true. The apple takes some time to take effect, so she's present for the first act, and we do follow her nightmares for a bit as she struggles against the poison. But those metaphysical struggles are just a bit too abstract. I don't get much of a tangible sense of what May has to overcome. Most of the dream is a sequence of torturous things happening to her. At one point, Barza prays to the Guardian Beasts and they send in some butterflies to help her, but that doesn't make her very active. Ultimately, she has to just jump into the fire. I think the butterflies at this point represent the children and she's proving her love for them and for her teammates by leaping into harm's way for them. But it's not as if she really needed to prove that or learn that. 
Her love for them was already pretty clear from the beginning. So it's not bad, but it feels generic, and I think there's a pretty clear reason why. This is the first episode to really focus on Mei as a character. The problem, as I see it, and I made this joke in my videos ten years ago, is that Mei as a character is solely defined as... the girl. Whereas there are four male characters that necessitate distinct personality traits in order to set them apart, Mei stands out among them simply by being... feminine. If there's something girly to do, she's your girl. And this episode leans into that so hard that it becomes extraordinarily transparent that the writers don't have a handle on her beyond that. This episode is 20 minutes of demonstrating that Mei is in fact a girl, in case you didn't notice. No boy, you boy. You can't have this apple, it's for women's beauty and health. Women don't like persistent men, you know. What kind of a man orders an attack on a girl? How dare you pretend to have apple titties? Mei escapes the prison of her mind by demonstrating how nurturing she is, I think. Even Bondora is falling harder into feminine stereotypes this episode, as her evil plan involves sapping the youth of children so she can be eternally young and beautiful herself. Good lord, the whole thing starts to feel very condescending after a while. I'm surprised they didn't title the episode Woman Girl, Pony Pink Pretty Purse Kitchen. It's not particularly unenjoyable, but it's on the nose and lazy stereotyping becomes very tiresome. To be clear, the Power Rangers characters are broad archetypes, and Kimberly is very much the girly girl character of this group. No way. Really? As simplistic as that is, there's nothing wrong with that. And while Kimberly fits that mold, she is defined in much more specific ways. She likes gymnastics and dance and fashion. Those are all traditionally feminine interests, but they are interests. Interests that define her as an individual more so than as a vague representation of half the population. So with that out of the way, let's see how Power Rangers handles this story. Foul Play in the Sky is remarkably different, actually. Or at least it ended up that way. Again, I can't really find sources I completely trust, but I have read this episode was heavily rewritten and reshot. Some of the footage does look like holdovers from a story that would appear to hew much closer to Fire the Golden Arrow. There are shots in the command center where you can make out a reclining chair, characters focusing and delivering their lines downward in that direction, Take care of Kimberly. and even an errant elevated foot. These all suggest that Kimberly was likewise going to be unconscious for this episode. Instead, Kimberly stays awake while everyone around her falls unconscious. Kimberly's Uncle Steve is a pilot and takes her, along with Bulk and Skull, for a tour of all of Angel Grove's important landmarks. The park, Vasquez Rocks, and the Youth Center. Little do they know that Squad has put a sleeping potion in Uncle Steve's grape soda, and boy does that man love his grape soda. It's worth pointing out how Power Rangers gets much more use out of Squat, whose performer wears a face covering mask, whereas the poisoner in Zhu Ranger was Toadpot, whose face is visible. With Uncle Steve passed out through magic and Bulk and Skull passed out due to fear, Alpha has to instruct Kimberly in safely landing the plane. And she needs to do it fast because the other rangers are struggling against Rita's latest creation, the Snizzard. Half snake, half lizard. And only Kimberly's power bow can take out the apple on its head. It's interesting that Power Rangers goes with a plot like this. It takes the focus completely away from the monster fighting formula. The Snizzard feels obligatory and barely does anything. It causes generic mischief. The other rangers are barely in this. I think Billy has one original line this episode. I can hardly move. Because of that, you might think I'd compare this to Switching Places, another episode where a Zhu Ranger plot is stripped of anything interesting about it and grafted to a completely unrelated story. And it's true that there is no real thematic connection between Kimberly flying a plane and a snake lizard monster. Mechanically, at least, they connect surprisingly seamlessly. Kimberly is missing from the fight. This is why that works. It would be better if these two halves of the plot had a stronger parallel, but this is not switching places where the new footage is so disconnected it actively hinders the old. There are some odd choices in the details, though. 
I'm not sure why Kimberly very briefly flashes back to the first episode. Seems kind of pointless. Since Kimberly has to get help from the command center, Bulk and Skull have to conveniently pass out for long stretches, which makes me wonder why they were written into this plot in the first place. You'd think putting these characters into a life or death situation together would create some opportunity for them to grow or bond, or at least have the bullies serve as an obstacle, especially given how it's set up that Kimberly doesn't want them there. And wouldn't you know it, this of all episodes introduces us to Angela, Zack's unrequited love interest. It makes a terrible first impression because she has no role in this story. Her scene literally consists of, I want to ask her out, no. The end. She appears in the tag for no other reason than for Zack to bump into her so she can spill goop on Bulk and Skull. That has become the go-to when a writer doesn't know how to end an episode, but any extra could have been carrying milkshakes. Some of this probably has to do with the aforementioned rewrites and reshoots, but eh, the episode could stand to feel less padded. On the bright side, Kimberly's conflict in this episode is much more tangible than May's and forces her to be more active. We understand what she has to do in order to save herself. Foul Play in the Sky, thankfully, also does not unload a dump truck of female stereotypes into its storyline. The fact that Kimberly is a girl is fairly incidental. Kimberly is a very bright and capable girl. Shush. That said, it doesn't really do much to explore Kimberly as a specific character. This episode would play out exactly the same no matter which ranger you put into this plane. It just happened to be Kimberly. And that's fine. Like I said, there have been other episodes that delve more into her personality and interests. This is a decent drama for most fictional characters to be placed in. I still think it'd be more interesting if it made better use of the characters in the plane, but it is nice to know that Alpha and Zordon can be counted on for more than just ranger-related danger. Still though, this whole thing must be pretty terrifying from Uncle Steve's perspective. I know we almost died, sorry, gotta go. Hope the toxicology report doesn't cause you to lose your pilot's license or go to jail. By the way, I just have to say, that gingham dress is so cute. If Fire the Golden Arrow has any small advantage over foul play in the sky, it's in how it explicitly ties getting rid of May into the success of the evil plan. I mean, the logic is not perfect. Other weapons can cut off small ornamental tchotchkes on a monster's head, and as far as a legendary arrow goes, well, May doesn't even wield the same bow anymore. But eh, you know, fairy tale. Over in Power Rangers, Zordon eventually surmises that they need Kimberly's power bow to take out the monster, and it could be inferred that's why Squat poisons the soda, but it does end up feeling a bit more like a coincidence that Rita's petty inconveniences happen to pay off this time, unlike, you know, in switching places where those same machinations have no material consequence at all. A final notable difference here is the resolution to the conflict. Foul Play in the Sky goes all in with the supposition that Kimberly has to save the day. Her well-placed arrow single-handedly kills the monster. It cuts around the fact that in Fire the Golden Arrow, said Golden Arrow is followed by the standard bringing together of weapons into the Howling Cannon. On one hand, I find myself surprised at some of the obvious moments of padding in Foul Play in the Sky if they could have just used this footage, especially given how often Power Rangers uses stock footage compared to Zhu Ranger. But on the other hand, I prefer the Pink Ranger getting to actually save the day in an episode that is entirely about her. Let me get this out of the way. These are both competent episodes. There may be some things each version does better or worse than the other, but neither is terrible, neither is amazing. They're fine. For story, I'm going to give this one to Zhu Ranger. It goes all in with his ridiculousness. As expected, its plot is more cohesive, its monster more integral. For characters, Power Rangers. The abundance of stock feminine stereotyping is something I really can't look past. It's so lazy. While Power Rangers misses all kinds of opportunities for characterization, what it has is far less grating. And for action, while I think some of the fights that were cut out are pretty good, they're standard Sentai stuff and what matters was kept in Power Rangers. The actual footage of the plane never really sells that there's danger, but the situation itself manages to hold tension and stand out from the pack. Plus, letting Kimberly take the win is an improvement over using the same stock footage from several other episodes, so Power Rangers wins for action and wins overall. 
At the very least, I don't think there are any weird order problems here. For Whom the Bell Trolls aired directly after I, I, Guy, and that's where the DVDs place it as well. The episode it's adapting, Become Small, follows in the footsteps of My Master by featuring an antagonist that is not a Dora monster. To my incredible shock, For Whom the Bell Trolls keeps that idea. Not only is Mr. Ticklesneezer an overall good creature who doesn't understand the harm he's doing, he actually keeps most of his unique powers his counterpart, Fairy Dondon, uses. They both shrink items down and collect them in bottles. How fun! The precise nature of each of these enemies differs wildly in order to fit within each show's established universe, but both create equally good ideas. In a concept that makes me absolutely giddy, Fairy Dondon comes into Bondora's life through a job interview. Plepricon has been complaining that he can't make Dora monsters fast enough, so Bondora has agreed to put want ads into the local fairy newspapers. This is awesome! Dondon leaves his fairy forest and heads out to get the job, showing off his own creations. But since they're too nice, Bondora dumps him into the city where he decides to capture lots of items to use as inspiration. So he picks up trains and motorcycles and Tokyo Tower because it's always Tokyo Tower. And he makes friends with a boy, Toshio, who just can't seem to do anything right and is always being berated by his overbearing mother. When Don and Boy find them and are likewise captured, they almost convince them what they're doing is bad, but Don has to be an idiot and yell at the child, leaving Toshio open to Bandora's temptation to stamp out all the adults who make his life miserable. And I mean that literally. She enlarges both Don Don and Toshio. I am hard-pressed to imagine a more surreal scenario than a giant boy rushing at Daijujin wielding its own sword against them. And Toshio's mother has some cojones, still trying to yell at him when he's 50 feet tall. It's up to Boy to mend these family bonds and make Toshio realize the error of his ways. Okay, you know what? That is kind of a hard act to follow, and it was a bit overboard of me to claim Power Rangers handles the idea equally well. It doesn't. But it does a surprisingly good job. First of all, hey, we get the introduction of another recurring Power Rangers character, their teacher, Ms. Appleby. And we learn Bulk and Skull's real names. Please give your full attention to Farkas and Eugene. Despite this being a high school, the curriculum comes straight out of fourth grade with such tantalizingly complex subjects as question marks. Why do we need them? But today it's all about show and tell as the characters present their various hobbies. It turns out Trini is obsessed with dolls, especially this family heirloom, Mr. Ticklesneezer. While Trini sleeps at night, Squat enters her room and brings Mr. Ticklesneezer to life, and he ends up doing most of the same things Fairy Dondon does, minus a kid sidekick. He captures planes, trains, automobiles, even Tokyo Tower. And it's up to Trini to convince her beloved toy that what he's doing is wrong. Power Rangers is surprisingly willing to be silly this time around. Not that Power Rangers isn't typically silly, but it tends to avoid playing into the fantastical, unless it's from Rita, or they can cloak it in science. That aversion has not served it terribly well considering how rooted in fantasy Zhu Ranger is, but this time they really go all in. They even keep the interview scene, now recontextualized to Rita trying to figure out what this new servant can do for her. Again, it doesn't play quite as well, but it comes amazingly close to capturing the same feeling of absurdity. The episode tries to give Rita a motivation beyond simply being evil. It implies she's acting out jealousy over Trini having spent her happy childhood playing with dolls while Rita was forced to learn evil spells. Depth to the villain? Where did that come from? What's probably least interesting to talk about, but most captivating to me, is the fact that Power Rangers actually makes a decent amount of effort to shoot equivalent replacements for shots they have to cut out, rather than simply cutting around them to varying degrees of confusion. If there are shots of Don Don and Toshio together, they shoot new footage of Tickle Sneezer. They add in plenty of new shots of Billy and Trini trapped in the bottle. Of course, there is one pretty glaring exception to that too, where a giant Toshio is clearly visible hiding behind the Megazord. Whoops. But it's really not that big of a deal. I was all ready to heap glowing praise onto this, both as an adaptation and as a story in its own right. It may be missing a few things, but it holds together so, so well. At least it does until the ending. <laughs> You're still here, thank goodness.
Yeah, it was all just a dream. This might very well be the most cohesive episode Mighty Morphin Power Rangers has produced up to this point, but clearly they didn't think so because they completely cut it off at the knees by rendering the whole thing as never actually having happened. Maybe they thought it was too silly for their show, although I don't buy that. The way they frame everything feels perfectly in keeping with how MMPR works, changing a naturally existing creature into a doll brought to life by Rita's magic. That makes sense to me. A troll doll capturing items in bottles doesn't seem any goofier than a gnome pulling a Pied Piper routine on kids. The only thing I can see them hitting a roadblock with is how to wrap it all up, since, well, they don't. I guess there was a bit of a dilemma there. They can't kill a monster who's so innocent, and they don't have the footage to anyway. It would probably open up a can of existential worms to take away his sentience and force him to be a doll again. He can't stay with Trini because then he'd have to continue making appearances in the show. And there are problems with the Zhu Ranger ending to simply let him go on his way and live his life because he doesn't really fit into this world the same way Don Don does. I still think that would probably have been the best solution though. Plus it would have created some pathos for Trini to have to let go of something she loves. That however is where the episode fails even discounting its ending. I thought this was a really good idea, could have even been better than the original, to make this personal for Trini, establishing a connection between a ranger and one of the monsters. Rita has, in a sense, violated her, taking something that brings her joy, that connects her to her mother, and perverting it to cause grief and harm. But the episode never goes anywhere with that. Trini doesn't seem to care at all that her favorite doll has been brought to life. It would have been perfect to give her Don's role, have her scold the toy from inside of her bottle. Instead, she and Billy simply become victims to be rescued. Even at the beginning of the episode, she shows little concern when Bulk and Skull snatch the Tickle Sneezer doll because it ends up just being an excuse to cover Bulk in volcano goop. I mean, come on, that could have ruined the doll, act like you care! The story chickens out in committing to its concept or even devising an ending, causing it to fall apart in these various ways. I would believe it if the dream aspect was added in at the last minute because the structure of the episode feels like it was written without it. Perhaps we can overlook Trini including scenes in her dream she wasn't present for. It's a bit harder to swallow that she knows what Rita's palace looks like, and it actually makes the random giant Japanese kid make more sense. But Rita makes her plans to attack Trini before Trini goes to sleep. That's not part of the dream. I guess Rita changes her mind. So here we are. It's complicated. Yes, the dream framing guts the story, no question, but I'm not going to let that allow me to overlook what this does right, and it does a lot right. It's a very competent episode, it's ending aside. The problem is, while I can laud it on its own, there is nothing it does that Zhu Ranger doesn't do a little bit better. Story? Both their stories are similar. But Zhu Ranger goes a little bit farther, and the fact that it actually happens and actually has a resolution means I have to give it to Zhu Ranger. For character, Power Rangers might have won this had they actually played up the relationship between Trini and Tickle Sneezer, but they don't. So the bond between Don Don and Toshio wins. And for action, once again, a lot of it is the same, and Power Rangers does a good job filling in the gaps. But it doesn't have a little boy wielding a sword against a giant robot, so Zhu Ranger wins. I don't want that to seem like I think Power Rangers did a bad job here. It doesn't. Aside from the whole dream thing. It is successful. It does what I've been recommending Power Rangers do. It works with its material rather than fight against it. So that makes it good, but it doesn't make it better. It just ends up a slightly watered down version of what it's based off of. And since these weren't really meant to be compared side by side, it's fine. For a half-hour children's program, it competently fills that time. Except for the dream thing. The dream thing sucks. So that's the all-new Mighty Morphin Zhu Rangers. Thank you for watching! This series and other series I do, like Dragon Ball Dissection, are available in convenient playlists, allowing you to find every installment in its proper order much more easily than figuring out the proper viewing order of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Let me know which of these episode matchups you thought would have won. Please consider supporting the channel if you can for fun rewards like early access to videos and our private Discord server. I will see you next time!